All right, guys, welcome to section 1.2 of Introduction to Criminal Justice. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about what the criminal justice system is. And again, this is going to be highly focused on the United States, um, but I'm sure if you live in a different country, you can find similar information about um, your country's criminal justice system. So, when we talk about the criminal justice system, we mean both the structure and the process. Okay, for those of you who have done English 101, what this means basically is we're talking about both a noun and a verb. Okay, um, it's both the law enforcement agencies and the the courtrooms and the the you know the the books of laws and all those things, but it's also the process that people have to go through. Not only the process that you go through if you're arrested, but the process you have to go through to become a police officer. The process uh, trials go through the 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 process of changing law right all that legislative stuff that you learned in your you know your government class or your civics class that's all part of the criminal justice system um it is it is huge it's incredibly complex and it's dynamic what does that mean dynamic that means that it's constantly changing okay and it can be everything from giant changes to tiny, teeny tiny little changes, right? So the Miranda v. Arizona Supreme Court ruling that we talked about last time, that was a really big, giant, monumental change, right? Whereas the, you know, the local police officer in Smallsville, Georgia, if he decides that he wants to send his people out on patrol, um, you know, from one area to another area, that's a teeny tiny little change, but it's important change, and it's those kind of changes are happening constantly again and again and again and again which makes for a constantly changing constantly evolving system okay now there are levels to our criminal justice system just like there are levels to our government and in fact they are the same levels okay at the top we have the federal system the federal system is countrywide every single person that lives in the country has to abide by the federal criminal justice system's rules right um, Underneath that, there's the state level. Now, the state level, there's 50 different systems, right? 51 if you count Washington, D.C. Um, and each one is going to be different. But anybody who lives in that state um, has, a, 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 has to abide by those rules. But then as soon as you move to a different state or even travel to a different state, there's a completely different set of rules you have to abide by, right? Um, and then underneath that, the lowest level is like the city and county level, okay? Every state or almost every state is divided up into counties. Louisiana is divided up into parishes. Interesting uh, footnote there. Um, and, and every state has cities. And each county and city has their own criminal justice system, okay? This is where the vast majority of the criminal justice system actually acts, right? Because when you think of law enforcement, what's the first thing that pops in your head? Usually, probably, the local city police officer, right? The boys in blue, right? You got the uniform with a little badge, a little hat, right? Um, in fact, here, I got I got a little, see, here's my little, my little motorcycle cop guy, right? Isn't he cute, right? He got a little badge, and he's got a little handcuffs, and he's on a little motorcycle. Um, so, each level has a different mission, has a different set of rules that it has to abide by, whether we're talking about law enforcement or courts or corrections or anything. Um, but what's really important is that the higher level wins. If there's a disagreement between, say, the federal government and the state government, or the state government and the city government, the higher level wins. Okay. Um, so if, if you know I commit some crime and it's a violation of both state law and federal law, if both the federal prosecutor and the state prosecutor wants to take me to court, guess who wins? The federal, right? Um, so every time we talk about the criminal justice system, we're going to have to talk about which level we're talking about. And if we're talking about the federal level, that's the same for everybody. If we're talking about the state level, there's 50 or 51 different systems, which makes it really complicated. And then if we're talking about the city and county level, there's thousands of different systems, which makes it way more complicated than that. Um, so we're going to have to be clear all throughout this course what level we're talking about. Okay. There's also four categories to the criminal justice system. 
A lot of folks just talk about the three categories of the criminal justice system, which is law enforcement, courts, and corrections. Okay, Most groups, or a lot of groups, I should say, uh, split the criminal justice system up into those three categories. Some split off uh, probation and parole into a fourth category. Okay, So when, when we talk about the three categories... Um, those people will, are lumping probation and parole into that third category, corrections. But a lot of people will kind of split that off and make it its own fourth category. Okay, So there's law enforcement, courts, corrections, and then probation and parole. Or community supervision is another way um, that a lot of people will, will phrase that, that fourth category. Okay, Now, why is this important? Uh, you know, oh, you're not a criminal, you don't you know, commit any kind of crime other than, you know, speeding, which, let's admit, we all speed sometimes, right? Um, why? What does this have to do with you? Why is this important to you as an American, as a taxpayer, as a, you know, why is this important? Well, the criminal justice system, how much money it costs Americans varies depending on who you ask, but most estimates put it at well over 200 billion dollars a year. That's billion with a B, okay? Over 200 billion dollars a year to pay for the police and the jails and the prisons and the courthouses, all that stuff gets really, 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 really expensive. So you as a taxpayer need to be saying, look, even if I'm never uh, uh, actually put into the system myself, I want to have a say over how this is done because that is incredibly expensive. I don't want my money going towards a system that is not working efficiently and working to make sure that we lower the amount of crime in the country. I, I want a system that increases social control without violating my rights. But I want that done efficiently and cheaply because I don't want to spend 200 plus billion dollars a year to pay for this system if it's not doing the best job it can do. Okay? Um, there are a lot of people in that criminal justice system though. Um, one in every 36 adults in the United States is at some point of the criminal justice process. Whether that's under arrest, whether that's in jail, in prison, facing trial, on probation, on parole, all those things. One in every 36 adults. That is a lot of people. Unfortunately, that is not spread evenly amongst all Americans. Okay? It is, there's a very large difference based on gender. Males are much more likely to be in the criminal justice system at, at any point than females. Um, it's, it's slowly, slowly, slowly closing that gap, okay? Um, but for now, uh, men are much more represented uh, at every stage in the criminal justice process, from arrest, jail, trial, prison, probation, parole, all those things. Men are way more uh, likely to be in the system than women. Now, it's also vastly different based on race, race and ethnicity, okay? Now, interestingly, if every semester in my course I ask which racial group or ethnic group um, is by far the most overrepresented uh, in the criminal justice system. And without fail, everybody, every semester answers African American, which, <coughs> nope, not African Americans. African Americans are actually the second most overrepresented racial group. The most overrepresented racial group is Native Americans. Okay, Native Americans are by far uh, the most overrepresented. Um, you know, they're I, I don't know exact numbers, but they're you know X percent of the American population, but they are way higher than X percent um, of the people in jail and prison and probation and parole and all those things. Um, and then second, of course, is African Americans. Um, then there's people of Hispanic origin, um, then um, Caucasians and Asians are way down at the bottom. Um, but it is not anywhere close to even um, based on either gender or race or ethnicity or any of those things. 
And one of the important kind of debates and one of the important kind of areas of research in criminal justice right now is why. Why are men so much more overrepresented in the criminal justice system? Why, why the racial differences? Why, I mean, at what, obviously there's some kind of race factor coming into play somewhere, but where? Is it a little bit spread all throughout the system or is there one spot where we can be like, wow, that is a really giant racial bias in that section? Um, so it's, it's, we're trying to figure out exactly where it is and how we can get rid of it, right? Because that's, it's not okay to have one racial group or some, a small handful of racial groups vastly misrepresented in the criminal justice system, okay? So, what, there's lots of different ways to talk about types of crime, okay? Um, the, kind of the most famous one, the one you'll see on TV shows a lot, things like that is street crime versus property crime. Okay? Or sometimes they also say violent crime versus property crime. Street crime and violent crime are, for, for our purposes, they're roughly the same thing, right? We're talking about the murders, the robberies, the rapes, the assaults, you know, things like that where somebody gets physically hurt, right? Um, it's the kind of stuff you're, you know, if you're walking down the street in the middle of a city and you're going down a dark alley at 3 a.m., Street crime is the things you are afraid of, okay? Um, whereas property crime is kind of crimes against objects. So it's like, you know, a burglary of a business or embezzlement or, you know, something like that um, where nobody is actually physically hurt. Um, it's just, uh, you know, maybe my, my fence gets spray painted or something. Um, that's property crime. Um, there are a few other categories of crime we're going to be talking about uh, this semester. One of those is that there's this term victimless crime, and I, I really don't like the term victimless crime. Um, you know, when people say the term victimless crime, what are they talking about? They're talking about prostitution, they're talking about drug use, they're talking about gambling, right? Um, and it's true, those are a special group of, of crimes where but I wouldn't say they were victimless. I don't like that term victimless crime um, because there is a victim. The problem is, and the difference with those crimes is, the victim is somebody who is doing it knowingly and willingly. And that should be a separate category, um, but it's not victimless. Um, I've seen too many people who have had their lives completely ruined because they gambled away all their money and all their family's money and all their friends money all the money they could steal or rob or you know get in any way um, I've seen too many people whose lives have been completely ruined because you know they got addicted to heroin and that is an incredibly difficult um, thing to to stop doing and so I, I think they were a victim I, I, I don't like the term victimless crime um, but they did become a victim kind of willingly and knowingly and did it to themselves. So that should be a separate category of crime, just we need to figure out a better name for it. Um, another category of crime we're going to be talking about is white collar crime, okay? Um, going back, way, way back, um, I don't even know when it started, um, there's been this kind of idiom in American culture where um, the, the poor and middle class jobs are called blue collar. Okay, so janitors, plumbers, dock workers, machinists, things like that, those are, I, don't, I have no idea where this idiom came from, those are referred to as blue collar jobs or blue collar workers, right? Whereas the more upper class jobs are called the white collar uh, jobs or white collar workers, this, you know, working at a bank, working in an office, working, you know, any, basically any job where you have to wear a suit, right? Um, those are white collar crimes. Um, and, and so if somebody commits crime based on that kind of upper level job, working in an office, working in a bank, working in a, you know, one of those jobs that, that, um, you kind of have to be on the upper level of the socioeconomic scale to work at, that's called white collar crime. Okay. So it's, you know, embezzlement and fraud and, you know, wire transaction fraud and all kinds of, you know, all that stuff. Um, and interestingly, 
if you ask people what kind of crime they're worried about, what kind of crime they try to protect themselves from, what kind of crime they think um, impacts them more, they will say kind of the, the street crime, the blue collar crime, the murders, the rapes, the robberies. Um, but if you look at it from a financial perspective, white collar crime is way, 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 way more impactful on people's lives um, than all of the car theft and burglary and robbery ever. Okay, um, there was one white collar crime back in the 80s, um, and they estimated it that it cost the American people the same amount of money as something like 3,000 years worth of street crime. Okay, so white collar crime is incredibly impactful, but it doesn't get nearly the attention that the the street crime does. Um, another thing we're going to be talking about is cybercrime. Right, cybercrime is any kind of crime that uses a uh, computer as part of the criminal act, okay? Now, everybody you talk to will have a different definition of cybercrime, and they're all terrible. Um, cybercrime is one of those things where you can't really define it, but you know it when you see it, right? Um, there are some definitions of cybercrime that would in I would argue would include basically any crime in, in the year, you know, the 21st century, right? Um, because if you say that any crime with digital evidence as a component, which a lot of definitions of cybercrime include, then basically any crime is a cybercrime because what do all of us have with us at all times? Right? Your cell phone. Um, as someone who, who, you know, one of my main focus areas, one of my main research areas is cybercrime, um, there's there's an incredible amount of data I can get off of one of these cell phones, um, and the I don't know if if you commit an armed robbery and I get evidence that you were at the scene of the crime on your cell phone, does that count as a cyber crime? I mean, it's kind of it's kind of you know it's it's blending with all other crime at this point, isn't it? Anyway, um, in a very similar way, terrorism. Right? Terrorism has a lot of different definitions, and they all stink. Right? Um, but most of the definitions of terrorism include some kind of, you have to have some kind of political or, or legal or moral um, mission. Right? Um, so blowing up a house isn't enough to be terrorism. You have to have some kind of political or moral goal to blowing up that house. Right? Whether it's a, you know, a racist goal or a or a political far right or far left ideolo ideology goal or something um, that you're trying to accomplish and you're trying to send a message with that crime, okay? Um, but both cybercrime and terrorism are one of those things where it's really, really, really hard to define, uh, but kind of you know what you, when you see it, you know what I mean? All right, so what makes our criminal justice system unique from basically any other in the world? Well, first off, in most countries, um, there is basically one police agency, right? The entire country just has one big police force. Um, at maximum, you know, maybe they'll have one national police force and then one police force for each, you know, state or province or however they split up their country. Um, and in the United States, we have not just one national police force, we have like a dozen or more national police forces. We have, every state has at least one police force, and then every city and county basically has a police force. Um, at last count, and it, you know, it's constantly changing because the system's dynamic, but at last count, there was 12,000 some odd different police forces in the United States. 12,000. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That is completely unheard of in the rest of the world. Um, there is no other country that has a system like that. So, you know, there are similar things we could say about the court system and the correction system and the, you know, even the trial process itself, right? They're all vastly different based on, you know, kind of which country you're talking about. So the United States is very, very, very different than all these other systems. Um, now, anybody who's taken that kind of, you know, U.S. Government 101 class can tell you all about kind of the separation of powers in American government, right? 
we have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. And they all have a different function and a different impact on the criminal justice system. The judicial, um, the judicial branch obviously has kind of the most direct impact on the criminal justice system because the judicial system is the judges, it's the courts, right? That's obviously has a huge impact on the criminal justice system. And they're a huge chunk of the criminal justice system. Um, the legislative branch, their job is to pass laws, right? So all of the laws you're gonna be accused of violating are going to have been laws passed by the legislative branch. So that is a big impact that the, the legislative branch has on the criminal justice system. And then, of course, the executive uh, of the part of the, the, the triad there, um, the police, law enforcement, is all under the executive branch, right? So the president, if we're talking about the federal level, or the governor, if we're talking about the state level, or you know the city council, if we're talking about um, city county level, um, they're the ones that control the police, controls their budget, controls their mission, controls all kinds of stuff. So each of those three has a vested interest in our system. And each one is going to have checks and balances to make sure that the other two are doing their job. Right? And that is a very, very important part of the criminal justice system. And there are positives and negatives to this, right? There are lots of really great things that come out of that kind of weird, quirky, 12,000 plus uh, uh, law enforcement agency system. And there are lots of negatives, right? So the positives, one positive is that it, you can much, it's much easier to focus your agency's mission to your particular constituency, right? So if you're in Smallsville, Georgia, um, the Smallsville Police Department can be very, very well equipped and well suited towards policing in that one particular city. Whereas if you just have one giant national police force, it might be a little more difficult for them to, to um, customize their mission and their goals and their equipment and their training for that particular area. Make sense? Um, one of the negatives is it's incredibly expensive incredibly expensive. Um, we pay a lot of money to have those 12,000 different systems uh, in the country. So, and I'm sure I could talk long and, and you know, say so much about the different positives and negatives of this system, but I'm sure you can think of, of some of them on your own. So, join me next time and we will talk about um, kind of the, pro the criminal justice process, okay?